Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. At the sitting of Parliament on Tuesday, the 21st of April, Castri South MP Dr. Ernest Hilaire raised a number of questions concerning the amendments proposed to be made to the regulations governing the National Insurance Corporation, NIC, as the institution will be responsible for economic relief to the country. Dr. Hilaire also posed the question of whether there will be any catch to the public in the near future when such a large amount of money is going to be pumped out of the NIC. Geneve Gonzag reports. On Tuesday 21st, members of parliament sat to amend the regulations of the NIC Act to allow the corporation to provide the social stabilization that was requested by the government. The National Insurance Corporation will be responsible for providing economic relief to contributors of the corporation who became unemployed due to COVID-19 for some three months in the first instance. Castri South MP Ernest Hillier brought forth a plethora of questions and concerns with regards to the changes in the details of the NIC program. Dr. Hillier chided the government for not providing the opposition with a program with the exact changes being made to the regulations of the NIC yet expected them to approve and vote on the changes. The MP stated that given the extraordinary situations that the country is being faced with, all documentation should have been presented to help with the decision that has to be made. We've been asked to come here in this Honorable House to approve an amendment. We do not have the actuarial report that guides that decision. We do not have the NIC annual statements to guide us. But even more importantly, or equally important, we do not have the regulations. Now, I know regulations do not normally come before the House for approval. But given the critical nature of the decisions we have to make today, not the decision to provide assistance, but the decision as it relates to we, acting as legislative trustees, as the member from V4 South said, of the NIC. Because a lot of the questions that I have could probably be answered if I saw the regulations. And Mr. Speaker, it would have been so much useful. I heard the Prime Minister earlier, and I usually listen to him very carefully, he said about decision making and the respect for democracy, and they like it when people ask questions, and they like it when persons raise issues. It ought to have been seen as something which is fundamental to share with us the details of the program. There we are asked to approve amendments to the legislation for a program that we don't even see the details of the program. The Castro South MP sought clarity on a few questions he had with the wording of the amendments being made to certain sections of the NIC Act, as well as evidence that the country met the criteria set out by the NIC. The previous G in the principal act is deleted and is replaced by a new G, sums for giving assistance and an economic relief program. And then it inserts a new paragraph key any other prescribed payments. Now I'm asking which prescribed payments are these? Because, Mr. Speaker, are these prescribed payments relating to the economic relief program? But J, newly inserted J, already speaks to some for giving assistance under an economic relief program. Subject to this act, the board may establish an economic relief program where 30% or more of insured persons have suffered a loss of income as a result of a pandemic declared by the World Health Organization. We have no evidence before us here that 30% of insured persons of NIC have lost their income. We have no evidence of it. In fact, the member from Catrice East made a comment, he tried to come up with, uh, with numbers. The member for Ancelay Canary said he was wrong. Now, it may very well be that 30% of persons have been affected. I'm not disputing that. I am saying we have no evidence before us of the numbers of persons that have been affected 
or is expected to be affected. He also argued that certain changes should not be permanent in the legislation as the dynamics of pandemic change and the country is susceptible to natural disasters. Thus, the particular change would not always be applicable to the circumstances the country may be facing. This has been made permanent in the legislation. I don't think it should be made permanent. I think this should be a sunset clause. That once the WHO has determined that this pandemic is over, it should cease to exist. I think it should cease to exist. It should have a life determined. Because I'll ask you the question, why should it be a pandemic only? What if for some reason we have a hurricane, a tsunami, a volcanic eruption, God forbid, and 70% of the insured persons lose their income? Then that won't apply. What is the unique in essence of a pandemic? If you're going to make it permanent in the legislation, what about a pandemic that is so unique? Isn't the emphasis more on the amount of persons that have lost their income? Dr. Hilaire expressed concern that there may be possible repercussions for members of the public with the NIC deciding to allocate such a large sum of money for economic relief. He has asked the government to be transparent with the public if that will be the case. He indicated that the opposition will continue to support the decisions proposed by the government. However, the party will continue to ask questions to ensure the public is well informed. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Genevieve Gonzag. In response to concerns raised by the opposition about the extension of the state of emergency, Prime Minister Alan Chastney made a case for the necessity for these powers when dealing with an unpredictable enemy such as the disease COVID-19. Shaka Wooding reports. As he commenced his presentation at the April 21st sitting of Parliament, Prime Minister Alan Chastney explained why it would be necessary to approve the extension of a state of emergency. If things are getting better, why would we need to extend the um, curfew? And I think that I tried to cover that in, 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 in my opening remarks that while things look like they're getting better, and while certainly the numbers of incidences that we've had would suggest, suggest that there is not a community outbreak, that COVID sadly is a virus that can suddenly take over. According to the PM, the COVID-19 situation could change at any time simply due to the nature of the disease. And this is of utmost importance for the government to remain in a position to react without delay. And it's that nuance of having to change times of the curfew, change the list of persons that you want to, or businesses that you want to be open, that flexibility that the emergency um, uh, uh, authority allows a government to be able to do. I, I would like to think, more than think, but I, I would say to you that I do not believe there's been any abuse of authority on this side. Chastney appealed to the public to remain in a state of readiness in the event of any unfavorable developments in the containment process. He says this is no time to return to a pre-COVID lifestyle. I just want to remind all solutions that we are a long ways away from being out of COVID. Um, certainly you just have to turn on your TV and look at what's taking place just in the United States of America, other countries here in the Caribbean, and understand that it's still a very much uh, a strong virus and one that poses threats to us. And that while what we've been doing has been working, this can change overnight. In a unanimous conclusion, the House moved in favor of the standing motion. And an additional period commencing the 27th of April and ending May 31st was passed. For 7 News, I am Jacques Oding. Community activist Aaron Alexander has asked the opposition to use its political influence and relationship with Venezuela in order to receive COVID-19 testing kits for St. Lucia. Alexander stated that other countries have received aid and in order for St. Lucia to get a true and comprehensive picture of where it is at, there should be resources to conduct mass testing. Geneve Gonzag has more in this report.
St. Lucia has recorded 15 cases of COVID-19 and no recorded deaths. This, by all indications, should be great news. However, concerns have been pouring in about the amount of testing being done in the country to ensure that an accurate picture of what is going on with the virus is painted. Community activist Aaron Alexander has indicated that he is very concerned with the level of testing being done in St. Lucia. He says St. Lucia needs to reach out to other countries to aid with providing testing kits. He is appealing particularly to the St. Lucia Labour Party to get comrades in Venezuela to supply St. Lucia with kits as the South American country has done for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica and Grenada. I want to um, send out my endorsement towards the initiative that was announced by, <laughs> by Richard Frederick on his program where he asked on the Labour Party, the Labour Party um, politicians, in particular Dr. Anthony and, and Honorable Philip J.P.A., for them to um, request and, and seek assistance from Venezuela in as far as providing the laptops for our children and also to provide testing kits for the coronavirus here in St. Lucia. To assist us with the testing kits, the same way they sent 3,000 to St. Vincent, 3,000 to Antigua, 3,000 to Dominica, etc. Castro South MP Dr. Ernest Hiller spoke to the issue of St. Lucia's exclusion by Venezuela with the donation of COVID-19 testing kits in Parliament on Tuesday. Venezuela has been in its usual approach to the Caribbean, a friend of the Caribbean. But St. Lucia joined a group of nations that sought to undermine the sovereignty of Venezuela. And we could not share in that fraternal gift from Venezuela. Alexander says the government and opposition need to put politics aside as it will only lead to the continued suffering of the country. Why are we suffering so? Is it because of bad policies by this government as far as Venezuela is concerned? People, we need to wake up and these things need to change. Alexander says the interest of the country needs to be put first in such critical times. Both parties need to use their influences to benefit the country. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Janive Gonzag. As the Caribbean region continues to move steadily to decriminalize the use and possession of cannabis, officials admit that the emergence of COVID-19 could push reform back by several months. However, a different story has unfolded locally by account of Minister for Commerce Bradley Felix, who suggests that the plunge of the tourism sector may indeed expedite local cannabis reform. I have actually um, asked that whatever report that is supposed to be coming to my desk be fast-tracked as it relates to the, to the cannabis option. And, and I'm sure very soon we will be making a, a, a statement on that. Well, I think there is actually a meeting um, today is Tuesday on Thursday um, with regards to the agency that has been uh, mandated to oversee that, um, which is Invest and Lucia, and I expect to get a report. There. Felix says as the cabinet continues discussions on economic recovery, the benefits of the cannabis industry in terms of market, export possibilities, and job creation will be discussed. An update will be issued following an April 23rd meeting with stakeholders. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. There's more coming up after the break. <laughs>